Hello? Who is this? Who is this? My name is Jeff Madzai. If you know me at all, and there's no reason you should, it's because you saw one of my short films, like this one here. But that's not the point of this. The point of this is... This guy. Ken Dodd. You've already seen Ken. This is him right here in my movie. Ken and I worked together. And one day he said to me, you need to meet someone. His name is Guy, Guy McCourt, and he lives in Barnesville. And he says he lives in a haunted house. Ken Dodd? Yes. He, he was a zombie, you know, did you know that? No, that's, I didn't know it. that, really? Yeah. Yeah, I delivered my t-shirt personally to his door. He said that you had been around and he had seen you. Yeah. Cause he's the one who first got me yeah. got hooked up. Yes. Because he read my second book yeah. and was like, hey, uh, uh, you know, yeah. and he was like, I know somebody that makes movies, yeah. you know, if you want to do a documentary, and I'm like, yes, please. I hesitated. The paranormal isn't really my thing, but I thought I'd give it a chance, and I arranged to meet Guy. Guy seemed nice enough, and we got along okay, but I still wasn't sure if I wanted to do this. That is, until he showed me this video that he made a few years ago. Keep looking over the right shoulder of the gentleman on the screen and you'll soon see what changed my mind about doing this. You've seen two or three, I've seen one for sure. Yeah. That's all I've seen. One bone kind of looked like a finger bone maybe. Or it could have been from an animal, who knows. Who knows? Well, yeah. That, but it seems kind of funny that, you know, an animal bone would have been found with a dress. No, my cat's not down here. Oh, Holy shit, I'm dude. There is somebody right behind you right now. Holy shit, it just showed up in the fucking screen, dude. It just showed up in the screen. I then, shit you not. I was convinced to at least give this thing a try. In case you missed it, here's what I saw. Kind of weird, isn't it? So we got together and worked on a screenplay, and we sat down to record it. This is how the movie started out. This is a small town. Small towns don't keep secrets. And there's never a shortage of opinions about anything. I don't know if here is any more haunted than anywhere else, or even what that really means. But I do know that Appalachia is dark and sometimes scary. Some things are dramatic and other things can keep you awake at night because they make you think about the big questions. Any attempts at logic or making sense of a situation like this can drive a person almost mad. Here, there is no sense to be made because it just doesn't make any. I just have to live with it. But I soon abandoned this avenue. It just didn't seem like the real guy. So what to do next? We decided to just let Guy talk. If it was a perfect world, I would like to move out of here. My whole life, I really didn't want nothing to do with paranormal or hauntings. I, I tried to stay, I tried to walk away from it my whole life. But at the same time, knowing that somehow this was always going to have a grasp on me. 
over the course of the next year, Guy's story and this movie came together in a way that I never could have predicted. Yeah, I do paranormal investigations now, but that's been uh, an arc throughout my whole life, the truth is. I mean, I'm not a medium. I don't claim, I'm, there's way more people out there that's more deserving of that name than me. But I do, I, I do sense and I do feel empathically around people. Your mind and your logic always kicks in. So your always first thing's thoughts first is somebody broke into the house, they're in there, you know, or you're, it's your friend, you know, playing, messing with you. Because they was like, oh, guy scares easier way, you know. So when somebody actually does experience the paranormal for the first time, it's mind blowing for a lot of people. It it, it changes your worldly views on a lot of things, you know. Because you think, oh, that, that's horse, you know. But it really does. It changes your perspective on a lot of things after that. It really does open your mind to other things in this world that. Well, maybe that could be true too. When my dad died, I didn't know nothing about this house. I didn't know, I just knew it was haunted. And as I started researching and finding out more and more, like it was, it came together like a puzzle. And, and the realizations of the puzzle was like, wow, this is what happened. This is why it's this way. This, you know, the fear and the pandemonium and the mania that we felt here, I mean, I'm just probably going to Give me an early grave, I'm sure, because of the stress in my young young adult life that we that happened here. Do you? Is there any one of the people who have been here and experienced things who won't come back anymore? Yeah. Yeah, there's quite a few of those that don't come back no more. And they say they won't say that. They don't want to say that, but. That's what I feel. You mean they always have an excuse? Yeah. Yeah. I have some friends, like now, I got a couple friends that'll even admit. Uh, I don't want to go to a guy's house to play cards or hang out because I just, uh-uh, I'm just not doing it. But some, you know, they just, yeah, some people say, oh, I got things to do tonight. I can't hang out, you know. I'm like, okay, that's cool. I understand, you know. Life is busy, you know. It is busy. I then asked Guy if he could recount some of the stranger things that happened here. I'm going to share with you something that I almost didn't want to talk about. One evening, I was home alone in bed. I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye, but when I looked, it was gone, so I figured it was nothing. Then I felt the bed start to vibrate, just a little at first, but then it got stronger. And I started to get up. I felt something forcefully push me back down on the bed. I couldn't move. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. I felt the pressure on my wrists. The bed started bouncing, and it rose up and slammed back down over and over. My heart pounded as the adrenaline rushed through me. My wrists hurt from trying to break free. I could feel a presence, but couldn't see anything. I heard laughter and felt a cold, icy breath on my face. Someone knocked on the door, and boom. The bed returned to rest on the floor, and I was free. I almost got the feeling like something, somebody was trying to tell me something. I, I'm not really a religious person. I do believe there is a God of s some sort of creator, but I'm not really religious. This land was originally bought by one of the first doctors in Barnesville, which his name was uh, Kyle Junkins. He was a very, very... Uh, staunch um, anti-slavery and whether he built these houses for for uh, the recently freed slaves or if they built them we're not sure for the history is kind of vague on all that from what we can gather from doing the research we figured this house was probably built in the late 1800s sometime maybe even up to 1900 and the doctor lived in one of those houses I think so Yes. Probably this one? Probably this one. What makes a house haunted? Is it something in the building itself? Or could it be related to the ground it's built on? 
What could have happened on this land that was so bad that it left some kind of evil imprint on this place? This house sits on the west end of Church Street in Barnesville, Ohio, which was founded in 1808 by James Barnes. In what now is the center of town, there once was a natural spring that reportedly was a favorite sunbathing spot for bears who lazed about on the fresh water come down from the hillside. Also in 1808, a visiting bishop preached a sermon near the spring and selected two acres near it to build a church. On the site were two huge mounds that were remnants of the culture of the great mound builders, some of the original inhabitants of this land. Though many still remain, mounds all over the area were dismantled by settlers at first, and then later on by the coal companies. The bishop had these two mounds destroyed to build his church. In the center of the mounds were found heaps of ashes and charcoal, which were surrounded by clay. The clay was salvaged and used to make the bricks for the church building, which was built right there on the same spot where the mounds once stood. I often wonder if the destruction of those two mounds could be the source of all my troubles. Was something disturbed by their removal? Is that church still standing? Um, that exact church, no. But there's another church in that spot? Yeah, that church burnt to the ground, like, well not burnt to the ground because it is brick, but it mostly burnt in like not long after it opened. Do you know if any of those bricks were used to build any of these houses? Um, I think so. Sometimes just coming home is difficult. I walk down the street towards the house and I'll look up at it as I approach. Often something will strike me as being off somehow. I'll get chills, then feel colder as I step up on the porch. A lump forms in my throat, making it hard to swallow. I open the door and get the sensation of something being wrong. I can't think clearly and I wonder if someone is there inside the house besides me. My grandma bought this house in the 40s late 40s maybe even up to 1918 or even up to 1950 maybe but I want to say more like the late 40s and she bought it just to rent out she couldn't keep it rented and it sat empty for three or four years and eventually my dad bought it why couldn't she get it rented keep it rented because of stories of ghosts and and paranormal activity and things and people would be fleeing in the middle of the night and not paying their rent and and it wasn't like they was not paying their rent and staying in here trying to stay. Like, yeah, we'll get out when we get out. They was not paying their rent because they was fleeing. But what I recently found out was it got so bad, my grandma even brought a priest down here to try to do a cleansing in this house back then. Through the years of coming here, we was like hang out here. We'd uh, stop, play cards and stuff like that. And... Uh, you would hear a thump or a bang upstairs, and maybe a door slam, a dresser. Uh, you know, I always questioned it, like maybe it was the wind or something like that. You know, it's an old house, it creaks and does different things like that, so. My dad tried to hide a lot of that stuff from me. You know, he didn't want me to know all that stuff. Every time I said I seen ghosts, that he was like, oh, there's no such thing, you guys are just talking, you know, whatever. You guys need to sleep upstairs, get in your room, nothing's going to hurt you. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just like, but you don't see it. You don't see it, Dad. You don't, you, how can you understand it when you don't see it, you know? He'd always tell me that there was this room in his basement that was blocked off and it was full of dirt. And he said his dad always told him that there was bodies buried in that dirt and uh, not to go mess around in there because there was it wasn't like in an opening but there was a little hole of maybe a couple blocks was missing or something and you could not where you could see in there and he always bring me down there as a kid and show me that room it wasn't full completely full of dirt but uh there was uh there was a good bit of dirt in there and it, it was kind of you know strange but i didn't think nothing of it but he always talked about it and he always talked about it. so finally one day we decided uh, I got this. We got a sledgehammer and a wheelbarrow and a shovel together, and we was gonna bust that block out and see what was in there. And uh, we took a couple blocks out, and uh, I seen something in the block. And uh, actually, it was this bottle right here. This jar with the letter in it. Uh, I know it was found in the block wall that we tore a few blocks out of downstairs to get in to dig that dirt out because we our curiosity was just driving us crazy. When the Robies bought it. He bought this house and the house next door to us. His plans was to make this one into a funeral home. 
And now, from what we was told when my grandma bought this house from them, is that the funeral home didn't do very good for some reason. I think he eventually closed down the funeral home and eventually let his daughter, Eva, live here. Eva Roby. Eva Roby, yep. Right there. And uh, we pulled it out. I, I, I don't know exactly what it says right now because it's been so long ago, but uh, it was a letter written from, written from somebody to their uh, girlfriend or spouse, a love letter, and he must have been in the military. So we continued digging. We got all the blocks out, and we continued digging, taking dirt out, dumping it out, and we come across a black dress and a black pair of pants. Well, you know, we was kind of freaking out because, you know, what's why is there a room with full of dirt with a black dress and a black pair of pants in it? Uh, maybe some kind of fragment of bone. Uh, I'm not sure if they continued digging after I left or, or what they found. But the, I, that was about where we stopped when the, we got to that point. And we left, as far as I know, we left the black dress and the black pair of pants sitting uh, down there on the floor or on a counter or something. We left them in the basement. Um, we took the jar out. We read the letter. It seems like a love letter. But, yeah, and, I mean, we put the letter back and everything. At that point in time, we put everything back. There was a little hole right up here where he had plywood nailed. And there was a gap about like that far. And I remember us kids like shining the flashlight in there. Because my brother was older. A lot older than us. Because that was from his first wife. He's like, you guys better not get in there. He's like, stay out there. He's like, they found, they found bodies back in there. When they was doing foundation work or supposedly. And then, so we was always like. He hasn't yeah. told you. Yeah. So we just thought it was a joke. You know what I'm saying? We're like, okay. We knew the house was haunted. Well, there was no doubt about that. But the body part was just like, okay, that's so, you know. So we decided to knock it down. We knocked it down. We knocked all this block down. And one of the guys was like, hey, what's that? I'm like, what? And he pulls this jar, just like this, right out of that block. This is wall. the jar. This is the jar. And... We're like, what? And he opens it, and I'm like, let me see it, let me see it. And we open it, and I couldn't believe it. Because we knew Groby's lived here. But we didn't know no names. I didn't know no names, of course. Okay, so this was a letter sent to Eva. Yep. And is it postmarked? It is postmarked uh, October the 11th, 1942. 1942, okay. Yeah. So he's right in the middle of the war. Right in the middle of the war. Actually, the stamp says, win the war. It's a victory stamp. It's a victory stamp, absolutely. So go ahead and read that letter for us. Dear Eva, please let me hear from you. I love you so much. I don't think I can stand it much longer. My life belongs to you. You can do whatever you want with it. My love for you is real. It's the only thing I have to live for. I don't know why I can never see you. I've never done anything to hurt you. Why can't you arrange a meeting Saturday morning or any time it will suit you? It says, please, please let me hear from you. Yours for life. P.S. Name, city, and street will get me okay. What the heck's that mean? That's what we said. We like there was no... There's no name. No name. No name. And it was very weird. Like we got... Where cold. was it sent from? What's the postmark? Um... Barnesville, Ohio. Hmm. They did say she was promiscuous. Yeah. So... Could have been one of many. One of many. So... It's still a, a lingering mystery. You know, they had the two kids, he was living here, and he ended up getting drafted into the service, if I remember right. And we know his name? No. He Eva's husband's name, we don't know. Okay. We don't know, because I do not think they got married. Because uh, Eva Roby, that's her maiden name. It's, you know, and it stayed Roby throughout the time. Yeah, it's okay. all the senses. 
The census that I could find it always said Roby, all the way up until the 1940s. So she had two kids with this guy? Yes. That was fairly unusual for the time. Yes. Well, yes. And I think that that's what happened. They kind of tried to shun that, and they tried to keep it hidden, I think. That's why he kind of gave her this house. And uh, Frank, her, her father. Frank, her father. How this all happened is not really linear, you know. I was learning things little by little, you know, and like it was like a piece of a puzzle. Everything was a piece of a puzzle and it was forming a picture, but it was never linear, you know. Like we didn't know about certain things until we had no idea who Re Eva Roby was. I tell my family I find this letter and they're like, oh, that was Frank's daughter or such and such, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, Nobody knows what happened to her. I'm like, what do you mean nobody knows what happened to her? Well, one day her dad comes over to check on her and the kids and the house is empty. And there's a, a letter on the table saying, Mom and Dad, I'm sorry, but we moved out west. Pretty much is what the letter was telling them. But they thought that was weird. They thought that was so weird, like, she would never have left without saying goodbye, especially with the kids. She took the kids with her? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that's what it said in the letter. Or, or the kids disappeared too, Yeah, we'll say. Yeah, the kids disappeared too. And they thought that was so weird because why? They, she wouldn't do that. She wouldn't do that to her mom, mom and dad and make them worry like that. Eva wasn't coming back, they said. There was something strange about her disappearance and about that guy and and Frank never did have a good feeling about her fiance or whatever and he decides to come over here and starts cleaning out all her stuff I'm gonna sell the house he said so while he's over here cleaning over the house he tells his wife he'll be home for dinner or lunch or something you know and he doesn't come home for for food so she comes over here looking for him. She's walking through the house. Frank! Frank! Where are you at, Frank? Nobody knows. She walks up to the top of the steps. And she walks into one bedroom. And she sees the closet door opened a little bit. And she walks over and she opens the door. And there's Frank. On the floor. All the way back up towards the corner of the closet and they said that it looked like he... I had difficulties with my camera whenever I tried to record in this basement. The batteries were fine, so I tried again. The word I'm pretty sure that was told to my grandma, his face was f ghastly frozen in fear. And the actual report of his death was a heart attack. While we were filming, Guy decided to have an actual medium come and look at his house. She spent some time in a ritual cleansing of the property by throwing some tobacco around the foundations in the yard, and then she went through the house. I was able to follow her with the camera as she did so. Sarah had never been to Guy's house before and knew very little of his story. What follows are some of the highlights of Sarah's visit. Eva, Eva, Eva. I don't know if she's saying evening, Eve, Eve, Eva, Ev, or something in the floor, in the floor. When we gutted this, we found carvings on the rafters. I never told nobody that because I didn't know what to make of it, but it was like stars, half moons, um, X's with like a hook on the top right corner of it. Um, just different things across this one, this one rafter right here in the middle of the house. It seems like she practiced. Yeah, a little practice, and her parents, she tried to always hide it from her parents too. Practice She's what? She's always into hiding things. Practice what? Witchcraft. Yeah. But I, I just like, I got feel of somebody that passed away up here. Right. And uh, it was a male presence, and it was her dad. She's letting me know, yeah, that was my dad. 
we do know from research and from what was told to my grandma when she bought the house that Frank Roby died in that closet. The dad? The Eva's dad, yes. After she came up missing. I, I'm sensing two children, though. Really strong right now. A boy and a girl. But I also seem like he always lurked to the husband. Did you hear that? Yes, it sounded like a, like a giggle. Yes. Somebody here right now? You know, she had a male that used to come by. Another boyfriend, perhaps. I'm just saying plastic. I don't know why I'm saying plastic. Plastic? Plastic. Like plastic walls or something. And like plastic, like, like paper, like bag, bag stuff, plastic. Yep. What is drawing me right here, anyways? Hey, remember what you said about plastic? Yeah, there's a plastic too, yeah. Just in case my creep's touching this thing. What do you feel from that? I feel, honestly, I'm, I'm just trying to pull it off as an animal, but it seems like a lady, definitely. Um, here's a big piece of it. Yes. It's not Max. Max is getting Max. This is for Max. I've seen a few shadows, heard a few things. And I also wanted to let you know, downstairs, like I told him, I feel that something needs to be unearthed yet. I want you to see what's on this letter. Can you open the letter? Is it? You go right ahead. Here at Eva, I would say. Guy had hoped that by letting Sarah read this letter, she would be able to give him some new information something that she could glean from reading the letter itself. Perhaps even something about the author of the letter. But Sarah couldn't provide Guy with any other answers. But he did feel like he had a few more pieces of the puzzle. What's your feelings from that? I sensed that later she had a, a boyfriend or you somebody that, yeah, that she had, besides the the one she was with. She was really sentimental with this, is why she hid this. Uh, she just wanted to make sure she kept it. Yeah, she was the type, she was always hiding things through this house. There's stuff through here you haven't even got yet. I think she's even done that with money, to be honest. Really? Yeah. Well, the letter we found in the floorboards upstairs, and you pointed right to where you said, there's a letter here. We did find a letter there, and it was wrote to a William and we feel that he was an axe murderer. You think Eva died here? Absolutely. So you really do think the bones that we found was probably hers? The human, yeah. And the kids, and... Yeah. You think the kids are buried there too? Yeah. Oh man, that's my worst fear. Definitely, you're gonna have to go down there and see if you can find anything else that you... Um, you could probably unmask another grave, maybe even, I don't know. Later, Sarah showed me a picture she had taken in the basement that she said had a figure in it. Right here. Here's a closer look. So we start digging the dirt out. See, and I refuse to have anything to do with that. I said, you're going into uncharted territories. Yeah, yeah. I, so you gotta say, I'm out of that because I had no idea what you guys were doing because I thought you were stupid. I said, I wouldn't be down there stirring stuff up that you don't, you already got it riled up. Because well, there was already, there was already a presence here. After these guys went down there and got in this spooky ass old, have you been down there yet? Spooky ass old corner was messing with stuff you don't need to be messing with. That's when things started to intensify. And we started wheelbarrowing dirt and taking it out here. 
I was never part of that because I got my freak on. I, I got scared. I said no more of that. I was like, well, hey, I got to get ready for this party, you know. So I'm going to go upstairs and take a shower and get ready for people to be here. And I'm upstairs, and I'm in the living room, and I'm putting my socks on, and, and I hear them start pecking on the floor. Hey, we found something. Hey, you know, so we I run down here. I'm like, what would you guys find? And he's like, I don't know. Look at this. And he starts pulling the dirt away from it. And uh, you could see it was looked like clothes. I'm like, what is that? And he starts pulling it out. And it was a, this gives me cold chills talking about it. He starts pulling out this like black dress and as he pulls it up out of the ground bones fall out of it and I'm like what is that and he's like I don't know but there's something right here next to it and he starts like moving stuff away and pulls it up and it's a black pair of pants it looks like it might fit a little kid and, uh, and I'm like oh man dude are you serious like we were I was like I think we just found bodies. So I'm like, what are we going to do? This is the same time they found the letter too. Yes. Same day. Same day. Same day. And I'm like, okay, you guys, we need to leave this for now because I need to figure out what I got to do. I'm going to have to call the cops or something. I don't know. Are they, you know, I'm like, am I going to get in trouble for this? I didn't know, you know? So that night, we get out of here. Um, I have people over. We're just hanging out, playing cards, talking, drinking some beer, and uh, all of a sudden, my girlfriend that lived here at the time, she had two boys. The older one come running down the steps, saying, "You know, mommy, 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 the TV's turning on and off. The TV's turning on and off. It's the bad man. It's the bad man, and I'm afraid for my brother Johnny." The one boy, I think he's uh, Chucky, was his name. He come running down the steps saying, somebody got to get my brother Johnny, somebody got to get my brother Johnny, which is, uh, Johnny was a toddler up there in his crib, and uh, they was up there sleeping, and something startled him. And the oldest one come downstairs, and he was screaming, you need to get my baby, my, my brother Johnny, my brother Johnny, you know, and, and there's a guy talking, there's somebody talking, there's a man up there saying, I can't, he's talking, he's saying stuff, you know, it's, can't remember exact details, but he was hysteric. I mean, this kid was crying. He was worried about his brother, Johnny. Chucky came screaming down the stairs. He, he was the oldest of the two brothers. Johnny was a little bit little, so Johnny's still not gonna pick up on this supernatural yet, but 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 Chucky was, but he, he knew what was going on. And he said something about the bad man. The bad man's up there again, you know. Bloody murder. Didn't want to go back up there at all. And we're like, buddy, you're just having a nightmare. Why don't you go lay down, you know? And so he does, and he finally goes to sleep. We didn't hear nothing. Johnny was okay. He was sleeping. Somebody went up, she went up and checked on him, and he was sleeping. So we're just hanging out, and all of a sudden, it just sounds like this. How, it sounded like the house was made of amplifiers almost. It sounded like a TV on full blast with surround sounds all through the house almost. It's the only way I can describe it. And it's ring like an old 1940s telephone. Ring, ring, and a woman's like, hello, hello, who is this? Who is this? And then it flipped to something, some other like static radio scanning noise. And then it flipped back to the phone ringing. There was a phone ringing. It was the, the ring of the phone. Yeah, there was a ring of the phone. I stood there. I was in thought. I was in trap. But something had me. Something had me pulled there for a minute. I like stopped and I could feel it. It, it, it had me by my ankles. I could, I'm remembering it now because I'm kind of getting goosebumps thinking about it. But it, it had me trapped in the hallway and it told me. And after the phone ring, it kind of said, you fuck off. And I'm like, and I was, then I was cussing it myself. When that voice, I mean, it was ironic that everything's happened. We're like, what's going on? You know, and we go to, Go and it just like, get out of here, motherfuckers, or something crazy, you know, real deep demonic voice. And we looked at each other because we knew there was nobody else up there. We'd been here for a few hours playing cards. There wasn't nobody snuck up the steps or anything. They would have had to go through the kitchen to get there, and we were sitting right there. Uh, it was really, really uh, intense, that's for sure. Yes. And then it flipped back to some preacher preaching about 
desecrating graves and messing with the dead, okay? And I'm, by this time, we're just like, what the heck is that? And it continues on for a few minutes. And people's just like, looking around, like, God, what is going on? And I'm like, I wish I knew. I have no idea. And somebody's like, oh, you got that floor model TV upstairs. I'm like, yeah, floor model TV. Nobody wanted to go up there to uh, get this boy. He's freaking, he's freaking out on what was going on. So I remember going up the steps. I just kind of blocked it out. I didn't pay attention to what was going on when I got up there. I just, my mission was to go up there and get this kid out of his uh, crib and bring him back downstairs. There was old wrought iron railing that were up both sides. It, it was just really dark and drab up there. And that console TV set to the left. So you get to the top of the steps, and I went to the top of the steps, and I know it didn't feel right. Something didn't feel right at all. And uh, when I come down the stairs, this kid, everybody took off running out the door. So whatever they seen behind me, I don't know, but uh, apparently they seen something, so I just followed him out the door. Instantaneous after that demonic voice, he's awake screaming. So I'm kind of pushing him on up the steps, like, come on, we gotta go, we gotta get him, you know? And he pulls that curtain back. And this green was lit up the hole upstairs. And as the curtain goes back, you could just see it dissipate right into the TV, right into the floor model TV. And we look and the TV's not even on. But when we come back inside, that black dress and that black pair of pants was laying on the kitchen floor. And, there, and then I'm just like, well, how can you explain that? You know, and so they leave and I pretty much locked the doors and I didn't come back. I tried to move away once to Virginia and live there for about three weeks before I got sick and had to come home. Another time, I made it halfway to Louisiana to help after Katrina hit. I felt sick and had to pull over somewhere near Chattanooga, Tennessee. The next thing I knew, I woke up in the hospital bed in Columbus, Ohio with a fever of 104 and no idea how I got there. Every step of the way, my life has revolved around hospitals, sickness, and a feeling that I was not alone. I have lost so much, and this house has preyed on that loss, as if it drew energy from it, dragging me down. I told my mom about it. She had a friend that was a sheriff, and he was just like, Guy, I'm telling you right now, we get phone calls all the time animal bones yeah it's just animal bones I just covered back up we did we covered it back up and after that it was like the floodgates was open it was insane shit would be flying through the room through the wall stuff would come up missing like you would lay it down you turn and boom it'd be gone like noises and screams and like I just seen a black shadow right there <laughs> Is that my arm? Nope, that was not my arm. That wasn't you either. Hmm. But anyways, yeah, pretty much a lot of stuff was going on. And the cool thing is, is I had a, a lot of friends at that time, and they was stopping by and checking on me, seeing how I was doing, and strangely enough, they was experiencing it too. Um, through the years, that basin has terrified me. Uh, multiple times throughout the years, I have seen dark shadows. Um, the shadows tend to stay along floorboards, move very quickly. I think that there are multiple entities here, whether they're ghosts, whether it's uh, more evil, more threatening than that. Um, sometimes I feel that things I see are harmless and other times you get a sensation of malice in the air. I felt threatened many times in this house by it. Um, felt like something has actually grabbed a hold of me and not in a sense of touch, in a sense of chi. Like I felt something like grab my soul at the base of my spine. And I've actually, uh, I, I can recall an event where I was sitting here, um, just showed up, had one beer, and all of a sudden that thing, whatever it is, I could hear low kind of whispery things and all of a sudden just lit up from my back all the way up throughout my arms and legs this that tingling pins and needles sensation and immediately had to get out of the house went outside on the porch and threw up 
you know, I've traveled all over the country and this is one of about six places that I, I've, I le legitimately frightens me, gives me the creeps a little bit. I would have to say if there's something to do with ghosts or spirit life or something outside of our realm, it's here. <laughs> yeah. We went upstairs to hang out. And one of the guys was like, oh man, where's my hat? He had his hat on when he come upstairs. Like, dude, what'd you do with your hat? Like, I don't know. Because we sat there watching Bob Ross. That's what we was doing, was watching Bob Ross. And he's like, where'd my hat go? I'm like, dude, you had your hat on when you come up the steps. He's like, no, I don't know. I felt it on my head, but I don't know where it went. So we go downstairs to look for his hat, because he's like, I don't think that was on my head. And there's all the pillows from the couch, the love seat, and the chair stacked up in a pile right in the middle of the couch with his hat right on top of it. A couple weekends before Christmas time, a couple friends, family, it was just hanging out. And uh, his girlfriend gave him an early Christmas present. And it was uh, a camcorder. So he said he was all excited, he got it, he wanted to try it out. He said, hey, let's go down in the basement. He said, let's take this camera down there and just try it out. And I was like, yeah, whatever, let's do it. So he took, us, took me downstairs, and I was standing in front of that hole, and uh, he was asking me some questions, and I was talking. And uh, next thing you know, he says, uh, oh, my God, oh, my God, I just seen something. I just seen something. And he turned around, and he went around the stairs. I, of course, I didn't see anything. So he got hooked up to the television. We, sit, we all sat here, him and uh, his girlfriend and my wife and, uh, and me, and we sat here, and we watched that. I was laughing because you obviously tell I was drinking. <laughs> and we just laughed. He's like, you know, check this out. You know, next thing you know, we're like, guy's like, what is that? You know, and he's looking behind me and we're like, I don't know. We just kind of freaked on it. And uh, uh, it was definitely, it looks like something's there. I can't uh, describe exactly what it is. Guy had warned me about strange things happening to people who spent any amount of time in this house. Now, I don't know what I really thought about that, but a few months after having first visited the house, I developed a drop foot and had to go to the hospital for back surgery. It turned out all right, though. People ask me all the time, how do you handle all this shit? How do you live in this house? I just look at them and laugh. Where would I go? Despite all that's happened, this is my home. I guess every town has that house. The one place that all the kids talk about and are scared of. The place that is said to be haunted. The place when you're walking by, you get to chills and think to yourself, just for a second, that maybe you saw a shadow in the window. That is this house. We found out later, through more research, that there was a an axe murderer lived here. His name was W.H. Gibbs. That actually happened to be his alias. His real name was W.H. Perkins. His family started doing some research on him and come to find out. He worked for the B&O Railroad. He traveled around from Maryland, Pennsylvania, all over. And every time he stopped in a town, he would send home a postcard to his family. His grandkids, I'm pretty sure, or great-grandkids, started doing research on him. And they found out that every time a town that he sent a postcard from during that same weekend, a young girl come up missing or murdered. And every single place he sent a postcard from. It wasn't just coincidental. It was every single one. We'll come to find out later is this guy was W.H. Gibbs. Now, W.H. Gibbs is a well-known serial killer. And he is the same person as Perkins. He's the same person as Perkins. So when he lived here, he was known as Perkins. As a but Perkins. But as he traveled across the country, he was Gibbs. Gibbs. And yep. Gibbs is, a, is known to have been a mass murderer. Mass murderer. Axe murderer. Yeah, an axe murderer. Okay. And that was his alias. Was you his know, name. yeah. And he traveled on the railroad just as a passenger, just like he was on vacation? No, he was actually an axe man for the railroad. Oh, that's convenient. Yeah. Yeah, like he would cut the trees and clear the brush so they could run the railroad through. When he died, they tore down the cabin he built 
and they found a secret compartment in the in the basement and they found human remains in that how we found out that Perkins had an alias was when we was doing the floor work upstairs because I had the floorboards ripped up and it was just the Joyce's and I'm walking on the Joyce's you know and trying to get all the pipes laid out and stuff and something caught my eye and I'm like what the heck is that I go over there and I pull it up I'm like what and I'm not and it's a letter from the B and O Railroad 1909 to W. H. Gibbs. Now, from doing the records research, I knew in 1909 a W. H. Perkins lived here. So that's when I made the connection that he was using an alias to, to commit murders. And I'm now in my mid 40s, and I need to have some of my questions answered for my own sanity. I decided to have a seance to see what they had to say. This is now a sacred space. Open your hearts and your minds to the spiritual world. Let's all close our eyes. Now visualize a pure white light shining down upon you. If, if, if you have your headphones on and you hear out of nowhere some static or uh, maybe a, a low mumbling or something like that, try to amplify it and maybe you might be able to get some words or something out of it. I evoke the great spirit of the universe, creator and destroyer of all things. Bless us with your presence and lend us your wisdom. Join us here in this rite. You know, don't try looking for it, but if it, something stands out, you know, try to amplify it and see if it's someone, something, maybe. All those who res reside in this house, come forth. This is a safe space. Be heard. As soon as I walked into this house, uh, started shaking and uh, that was a little out of the ordinary it, it, it felt like there is a presence in this house as soon as I walked in here and uh, I've never been in this house before and so what we did here tonight was we tried to will the spirits to come out and to summon them. So I summon you, come forth and show yourself. Speak with us. Give us a sign you are here. I offer wine and bread. from the physical world to the spiritual world. It's, it's all a system of natural, a natural occurrence. Don't be afraid to come out. Everybody is built with an energy within them and energy cannot be destroyed, only changed. So in my mind, that makes us have a soul. Why do you stay here? Did you die here? Was you killed here? And I believe that a soul lives on and that that's what spirits are. Is somebody holding you here? Yeah. If that was you, can you do it again? As soon as I walked in, I just, I felt chilled to the bone. And then whenever we sat down, I just couldn't help but shake and shiver. And you'll probably see me in the video sitting there rubbing my arms. And Why won't you go forth into the afterlife? And then, I mean, we heard those few noises and that's, I don't know who else.
to how to explain it. I mean, you just get the feeling as soon as you walk in, something, something's here. Alright, can I move? You can move. Is that you, Ryan? No. What did you feel? Something touched the back of my leg or the side of my leg. The top half of my body getting really cold. Cold chills. Quite a few times, but it hit me really hard when he was closing the sounds. Well, getting ready to close the sounds. <laughs> And a really bad pain in the middle of my back out of nowhere. But that's it. I experienced something touching my leg. At first I thought it was him, that's why I jumped. Because I felt it on my right leg. And when I jumped up and looked, his legs was under these legs. So there was no way he could have done it. Can you come forward, please? So we can show everybody here. Make a noise or something, anything, something loud to let us know that you're here. I have no idea. I, I have no idea. It just knows that whew, it was it was heavy. Here and now is the time. If you ever wanted to be heard, you come out. You speak. We may not be able to hear you now, but maybe these cameras will pick you up. We'll hear your message. Did you get any answers tonight that you were looking for? No, unfortunately. I wish I did, but I am one step closer, I feel, though. Because I feel that you probably will find something on the video. I will now close the ceremony. Watchtowers of the North, element of Earth, we thank you for presiding over this rite. We now release you and thank you for coming. Somewhere over That's creepy. When the computer started making that noise, I knew right then and there. Does it do that? That's the first time I did that. But you said you knew something when you heard the computer. What did you realize at that point? That it was probably something spiritual from this house. Something trying to let us be known like it's here. I reviewed the audio and the video from the seance and it revealed no further signs or signals and no other anomalies were discerned. I asked Guy to talk about the earliest memory he had of strange occurrences in this house. One of the first times I was eight or nine years old, I'm in my room sleeping and my sister she comes running into my bedroom and jumps into my bed and starts trying to cover up and she's just shaking. God, I'm really scared, I'm really scared. It's messing with me, it keeps pulling my blankets off my bed. I'm really scared, you know, and I'm like, I'll go over there to your bed and, and, and lay there until you fall asleep, you know? And right when I'm about to doze off, I feel a tug on the blanket. So I kind of pull on the blanket a little bit. It pulls the blanket again. By this time, I'm like, okay. I give it another tug, a little harder, and this time it tugs the blanket so hard, it tugs it out of my hand. And it is this weird noise. I'll never forget it. We had carpet up there, but it sounded like a wooden spool that was not quite round on a wooden floor, like a do -do 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 when it went under the bed. And I'm just like, what was like we I had no idea she's like see I told you I told you and I'm like okay we had this little poodle I'm like it's curly it's curly he's trying to get warm he's crawling into the blankets I'm like okay so I I wasn't scared I'm like it's curly so I immediately start reaching over the side of the bed and start pulling the blankets back out as I'm pulling this blanket I'm like man Cur curly you really got yourself wound up in this blanket 
And all of a sudden we hear, ting, 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 ting. Because he had a little bell on his collar. Here he is coming up the steps. I raise up and I look at her. She said, see, I told you. And I'm just, we just folded. We went downstairs and jumped on the couch. By this time, I had heard plenty. It was time to take some action. I think that's the next thing we gotta do is dig that up, don't you think? I do, I do. I wanna, I wanna dig it out and put it to rest. I'm ready to put it to rest. It's consumed a lot of my life and I'm, I'm ready. So in September of 2018, we decided to dig. I brought a couple extra guys with cameras to help out. I just hope whatever it is, whatever they are, that maybe they can get a proper burial. Maybe it might help what's going on here. How far down do you think we're going to have to dig? The last time I remember, I think we was almost to the level of this block here. Maybe a little bit lower. So we said, okay, guy, you start us off. You go ahead and make the first shovel full. And that was the first of many, many shovels full. Throughout the year that it took to make this movie, I often asked myself, why does Guy persist? What does he think he's going to find? How is anything that he finds going to make people believe his story? But that made me think about my own situation. Why would anyone want to watch this movie? Sometimes what other people think just doesn't matter. You gotta proceed just for yourself. So that's what I'm doing. With my crappy camera, my poor lighting, and my questionable audio, I'm going to proceed too. And look at me. Now I'm even helping with the dig. And after about two hours of dirty, dusty digging, we uncovered the first piece of clothing. It hadn't seen the light of day since Guy dug it up last time, 23 years ago. The one of the twins, Marlene, she had two boys. And she was coming to stay the night. It was a weekend. And we was in that bedroom and there was two twin beds. So she decided to scoot the two twin beds together so we could all sleep in there. We're all in there on the bed, and if I remember right, we had the light on outside, but not inside. And we sat in there on the bed, getting ready to go to sleep. And we hear something come out of that closet. You can hear it walking across the floor. Step, step, step. And it walks right up to the door of the bedroom. And you could see the shadow of its feet from the light behind it projecting it and I'm like what is that and my older sister grabs her two boys and me all three of us and pulls us close into her and backs up towards the headband and she's like I don't know I don't know what that is and her youngest boys like points towards the door and is like monster mommy monster you can hear it oh, oh. but have you breathing and we're like we're scared to death. We're just kids, you know, and she, you could tell she was scared too because she was pulling us in close to her and she's just, she was scared. And then you heard it walk over to the next bedroom and go into that bedroom and it, you could hear the door open and close. And we're like, well, who was that? Was that Jake? Was that Jake? She's like, that was Jake. That was probably Jake, my brother. Well, she, we wake up in the morning and come downstairs and she's like, did Jake ever make it home last night? And Dad was like, no, he never did make it home. And she looked over at us and she just kind of shook her head and kind of gave a smile. And we was just like, wow, really? You know? And, and then I'd tell my dad and he'd be like, no, no, there's no such things. He said, that's all in your head. That's just your mind playing tricks on you. You know, he knew things was here. 
but he didn't want to talk about it or feed into it because he didn't want us to be too so scared that we didn't want to sleep upstairs. Why does Guy and his story have such a pull on me? Maybe Guy's right. Maybe it's this house. Maybe this house does have an effect on me. He says it affects everyone who comes in. I hadn't noticed anything yet, but maybe this is the effect it has on me. It makes me want to help Guy, help him prove his story. Or if not prove it, at least help him get a grasp of the bigger picture. I had to wonder, was Guy's story making me change my mind about the paranormal in any way? By the time I was two, my balance, I didn't have very good balance. And I kept falling over. And I kept having these weird little seizures and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And so they took me to the doctor and and the doctor said, well, baby's head too big. He was like, I'm going to send them to Columbus, to the endocrinology labs. He's like, uh, there's something going on with him. Well, come to find out that I had a tumor on my pituitary, which is what regulates our growth. But it, it does so much more than that. It regulates uh, organs, our kidneys, skin, our fingernails. Our, Master gland. The boats, our bones. I mean, you know, that's... That's the reason I can't straighten my arms out is because of the, what that has done to me. It caused, it caused bone growth where I have calcium deposits on my elbows. Hold up a little bit. So, try to straighten your arm out there. That's as far as I can straighten it. From being sick from the tumors, I've had pneumonia multiple times, and I died, like, and brought back three times from the, from the pneumonia. And I do have a memory of an out-of-body experience. Do you think that's what made you become able to be aware of that kind of stuff? I think so. One of the things most re recent is what I call the gray witch. I start hearing this weird noise. It sounds like a weird, like, electric chainsaw thing. It's like, and I'm like, and I wake up and I look at the TV and I'm like, well, what I'm hearing ain't matching what's on the TV. And I start to focus and keep hearing it. And I look down to my right and I see this on the floor. As I focus my eyes, I can see it's gray. And I'm like, what is that? And as I start to try to reach down closer to towards it, it looks up at me. And, 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 and it has this long face, and it's obviously a woman. And it, and it looks at me, and, and it jumps from the floor on top of the bed like a cat. And it's holding me down, and I'm moving, I'm trying to get out from under, and it's like, drooling like it doesn't say anything it just makes this weird moaning noise and I'm like struggling trying to get out from under it and I can move but I felt like I had 300 pounds on top of me and I'm just like get off of me you bitch. you know and she jumps off the bed and she starts walking towards the bathroom backwards looking at me She's looking at me, it cr hunched over, walking backwards and towards the bathroom and disappears. I was having nightmares about her and I woke up in the middle of the night screaming. And my fiance 
was like, Dai, what are you talking about? And I'm like, I'm talking about this great witch. She's like, what? And I'm like, this thing just makes this, she's like, and she finishes my sentence. She's like, she just makes this weird moaning noise and disappears into the bathroom. And I'm like, yeah, and tears start coming down her eyes. She's like, God, it's been torturing me too. So here's all the stuff that they pulled out of here today. I don't know if you want to ask me a question or if you just want me to well, talk. Let's start with what you have there in your hand. There's definitely denim that looks like you can see, this looks like more modern denim because there's like proper machine sewing on it. But this over here, this looks like it was hand sewn even if it was on a sewing machine. So there's like some really clearly modern material and some really old stuff and this stuff was in there with it too and there is nothing left apart from the thread like it's to the point that it's just completely shredded itself and that is black material mm -hmm. and this is black material so just like guy's dress that we've talked about before it may be all that's left of it you have loads of bones but no idea what they belong to yet, although there is absolutely no way that this came from this little teeny tiny rat. <laughs> <laughs> so there is still, there's still somebody's head in there somewhere. What I think is so interesting, Guy, at the end of the day, and this newspaper in particular, the one that's the still got the wartime, that then the drowning that's creepy, that may be from your, you know, right before your family. Everything that would have been from around the early 1950s, around the time that anyone you're familiar with in your family bought this house, any bits of plastic, anything we know was invented or datable from that time period on is only on that very tip top layer. Yeah. And whatever is down in that dirt has been there like a really long time. My mom was like, guy, we need to have somebody come in that house and cleanse it. And she, I think her, because her Aunt Melba, when she raised her, was Catholic. And I think she contacted a priest up around Pataskala, if I remember right, to come and maybe do a, a cleanse and a prayer. He comes in here and we're talking and he starts getting his thing ready. He puts his thing around him and starts getting his cross and starts, gets his Bible in his spot where he wants it. And all of a sudden you hear... Boom, 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 Who's here? Nobody. He and you. So he's like, okay, he's still getting ready. And then all of a sudden it sounds like it's coming down the steps. Like it usually does. Like something's falling down the steps. Boom, 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 boom. And he kind of looks at me and I'm, I, I got a straight face, you know? And he's like, kind of tries to smile, but at the same time it's like, what was that? You know? And I'm just like, that's why you're here. And he starts spitting the holy water and starts saying the prayer and stuff, okay? And I can't remember exactly what happened, but something, something happened. And it's, it's, it scared him. It scared him really, really bad. Takes his thing off and he puts it all back in his little case and he's like, I'm sorry, young man, I cannot help you. And I'm like, what? He's like, I'm, 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 and he's shaking. He's just like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. He just keeps saying, I'm sorry. And he jumps in and he's driving and pulls and goes up the road. And I'm thinking, what, what happened? What did he, what did he experience? A couple days later, this Kathy woman calls me. She was a demonologist, a psychic, something. She's like, um, I talked to Father Henry, and she's like, I'm on my way to, to give you a hand. She comes in, and she's like, woo. And I'm like, you think, you know? I'm like, yeah, you know, like, I've been telling people in this town my whole life that this place is messed up. But her, she was just like, whoa. She says, well, you got many, many things going on here. She's like, who's the little kids? She's like, like, the little kids are coming up to me right off the bat. I was like, I don't know who they are. I, I've heard them and I've seen them. And she was like, they was murdered here. You know that, right? And I'm like, I had that feeling. She walks back towards the kitchen and she walks through the thing and she 
kind of starts sobbing a little bit, and I'm like, what happened? She was like, the little boy got tossed down the steps by the father. And I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, he died. She's like, his last name starts with an R. I was like, can you tell me what era? And she's like, no, 1940s, probably. And I, I'm just like, by the whole time, I'm getting chills, my hair standing up on edge. And Who are you thinking? Eva Roby's kids. And yeah, she's like, yeah, he died very tragically. She's like, he broke his neck. And uh, she's like, you hear noises, like sounds like something like falling down the steps all the time. And I said, yeah, she said, that's, that's that moment reliving, like on a tape. She comes through and she does a cleansing. And she, she's like, you got many things going on here. She went upstairs and she said, a man died a tragic death in that closet. I'm like, yep, yep. We come down here in the basement and she says some other things. And I can't remember exactly what she called it, but she called it something. I think she called it a gin. And I know now what a gin is. A gin is something that's been conjured from a ritual, from a black mass ritual. And it's very powerful. And uh, she also, I'm pretty sure she's also the one that told me that my dad stays upstairs to protect me from what's down here. And she does her cleansing. She comes through and does a cleansing and she has this jar with salt. And did you see that light flicker? No? Ah, okay. She uh, has this salt. She's holding it open and she's just closing it. And she's doing her cleansing with the sage and she's using an eagle feather and she has this uh, uh, i can't even remember everything that was going on but what was so profound to me is every time she waved that feather across that smoke of that sage you could see like figures coming out in the smoke and like they was dissipating like it was making them disappear or something and she comes into this one room and this is the room that has the flies in it every year Huh. And she said, that has been here for a long, long time. She said, he's hard. He's hard to get rid of. But when she got finished and we felt something coming in on us, and all of a sudden it was like, like the light shining through into my house. Like this curtain was lifted and the light was shining in on us. Like it was like, the darkness was lifted. She said it won't be permanent. She said, she gave me her name and her number. And she said, if you have it again, she says, I'll come here. And she drove from seven hours out of Pennsylvania somewhere. Like for the first time in my life, I could actually sit down in my house and breathe. Just, I wasn't tense. I wasn't anxious. I wasn't looking over my shoulder. I just could relax and breathe. And then this stuff, I mean, this is really, this is really old. And this is from down in the middle. This is not something you turned over. This was solidly locked in the middle of all of that dirt. Think of your family as the contamination, <laughs> you know? Like whatever the real mystery is came before them. Like whatever contamination came from them taking over the house in the 50s, it's all just right there on top, you know? Yeah. The interest, like, uh, I was about two feet down. Yeah, this is like two feet down and locked into dirt and away from anything that looks like it could have been made in the 1950s. Like there's something that's, it, it makes, it, it's curiouser and curiouser because there's no reason to lock up that much topsoil. I agree that it looks cut. Either that's super creepy or that's like animal husbandry. You know, that there's something, somebody's manipulated the bone for sure. If somebody was murdered, I mean, would you take the time to cut the bones? <laughs> if you're gonna bury them in your basement, I don't know how it works. Like, what would you do? Back in the day, people used to throw out like the bones and things like that, like especially the pork chop bone. It makes sense, but it doesn't make sense. You would find that in a walled up basement room. Nobody was coming down from the kitchen and dumping their pork chop leftovers in the basement. That's the kind of thing you do with the dirt pile out back. It's confusing. I don't have any answers for you, but it doesn't make sense. I don't fear it anymore like I used to. I used to fear it and would run from it pretty much, you know. And I kind of 
I had a turning point in my life where one day something was chasing me out of the basement. I was doing clothes and it chased me. I, it was right up behind me. I could hear it. It was following me. And I just got to that point where I was like, I screamed out loud as loud as I could. Like, leave me the hell alone. You cannot touch me. You cannot bother me no more. And it just kind of relinquished after that a little bit. It took a little while, but I, I have come to peace with it. All right, so the headline is something about the war. About the armistice. Yep, yeah, but I can't make out anything other than that. New new impasse on, on armistice, maybe something along those lines. But depressed mother drowns self and son is the headline. And we have found so many pieces of newspaper today stacked together five deep and the one news story that's actually there all in one piece with the picture of the little baby and the mom and everything. That's what's in there. You know, what were these attached to? Why are they just embedded in the mud all know. the way down? I don't know. At least a swirling top layer of like weird bits makes sense to me, but if this was just embedded that far down, why isn't it attached to whatever it was still attached to, you know? Yeah. I expect it to be nailed to something, or I expected you guys to pull something else out right behind this, right. actually. Like, that's when I right. got excited that I thought you were gonna, and then there wasn't even any wood to go with it. Nope. So it's, it's Whoops. weird. I think you have a tremendous amount more space to find all kinds of interesting things. You know? There's a whole world in there that is yet to be explored. Is your, are your mom still living? No, my mom passed away from cancer a few years ago. And your brothers or sisters around still? No. I've lost all damn near everybody close to me. I couldn't be more happy because it proves to people, not only myself and my friends that was here that experienced it, but it proves to the world in my eyes that, look, it wasn't, we wasn't crazy. We didn't make things up. There was no mass hysteria about it all. None of that. We, see, we found a black dress which is what's, that's what's left of it. We found a pair of blue pants, denim pants that would fit somebody really tall, like a six foot four dude. There's the denim. We also found a little pair of boys pants and like an old Amish clothing that was, and there's that, the black Amish clothing. We found newspaper, we found the wood, we found bones, we found seashells. Uh, there was so much we have found that validates what I have said and written about so far. Even when I go on vacation, by the time towards the end of the vacation, I can't wait to get home. You're just pulled back. Pulled back every time. Something's in here pulls me back. It's well known that Eva Roby had two children. A little girl and a little boy. Uh, multiple people through my family have seen the little girl. And when you find fake little pearls hair ties, uh, seashells, and a seashell little purse thing was really common back in the 40s and, and stuff. And uh, it, it just makes you wonder. The man that committed this is still here and he's holding power over those, whoever he killed and who's ever in here. Yeah, I'm gonna keep digging until we find the truth. Um, Again, even if it's not human bones, it, at least it writes off that one chapter of what could be causing the paranormal activity. Now we know if it's not that, it's something else, and we then we can start a different chapter to see why and what. You have another piece of the puzzle. We've got another piece of the puzzle. People ask me, it's like, why don't you just sell it and move out? I just, I can't sell it. I don't want to sell it. It's more of a sentimental thing than anything. You know, it's the home I grew up in. It's a lot of things. Even Memories, with, you know. Even with all the baggage, you yeah. wouldn't. No. Wouldn't yeah, want. even with all the baggage. Because there is a lot of good memories here on top of the bad, too. Yeah. So, but it's, uh, I would like to move out. I would hope I can move out, and I hope whatever's here does not follow me. That's what I hope. 
I'm really, really glad that we found the parts, particles of the clothing because that was one of the biggest things. Like the bones that we always found, the bones we found was not a lot 20 some years ago. You know, we found that big bone and another big bone and some little bones like this, which look like they could be a foot bone or a finger bone. But it was enough for us to see. It was enough for us to be like, whoa, whoa, uh, we need to leave this alone until we figure out what to do with it. And then that night, that paranormal, uh, 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 what would you call it? Just when that happened, it changed everything. The only thing we wanted to do as quick as possible was cover it right back up. That's the only thing we could do or think about. I can't wait to see for people to see this documentary and give me their feedback on what they think, you know. And I know a lot of uh, homes and a lot of foundations have them little sections where they, they got dirt and they just build it down so far. But this is not like that. This is not open above it. It's all blocked in all the way to the to the rafters. It don't make sense. And unless you're trying to hide something. Yeah. Yeah. The house of tragedies, but also the house of good memories too, you know. And in a lot of ways it's consumed my life, actually. It's it really has. It's consumed my life. I've I've never moved on because of a lot of this right here. I'm trying to wrap my head around what happened and who was involved. And it's not only just my story, it's it's my family's story. Mm -hmm. It's it's Eva's story. Mm -hmm. It's WH it, it, Perkins, WH Gibbs story. It's a, it's a, it's, it's. <laughs> How much dirt would you say we dug out of there today? Probably a ton of dirt. Dug a ton. Felt like every bit of it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you can see it there. That's a pile. That's a pile right there. <laughs> And we've been digging that out with everything and shovels and buckets and there's probably a half a ton laying on the floor in there. That's true. But we will get this dug out and get to the bottom of it. And in a way, I'm kind of happy that it's finally to that point. I'm going to sift daily. I'm going to make me a frame with some screen and so we can sift it and try to put the puzzle together. I just want to dig it out and figure it out. Get to the bottom of it. Literally and figuratively. Yep. What if, what if this, right now, the movie ended right now, what happens? What do you want to say if that's the case? Ooh, that's a good question. <sighs> if the movie ended right now, just with what we found here, I think we've made a pretty convincing case. And a lot of it is just right here. It's just come together right here on this table. And if the movie ended today, I think we've done our job. Even if it ended today, I still think we've done our job. I mean, that's, we've presented, I think, a pretty solid case. I, uh, I do. Does Guy's story end here? I don't think so. I think he'll persevere until he finds his answers. He'll climb back into that hole and dig until, as he says it, he can put the pieces of the puzzle together. Because I don't think Guy's doing this to convince the world. He's doing this because he has to. He won't quit because he can't quit at least until he gets the answers he's looking for. But on the other hand, maybe some things just aren't meant to be dug up. Maybe this basement will try to keep its secrets for a long, long time.